All right. Um, we are going to look at um, the code here, starting at where we actually start the game. If I remember right, we had kind of covered the other stuff. We had talked about the canon game. Really, object doesn't really have a lot in it. It creates an instance of the view, and it grabs gestures, and it calls functions um, on the custom view based on the based on the gestures. Most of the stuff happens in the canon view, and we went through a whole boatload of initialization and calculation of stuff so that um, the size of it was dependent on the size of the screen. And if I'm remembering right, we got to this point where it did this on size change, which again would be any time the size of the screen changed or when it's first added to the view hierarchy, in other words when it's initialized. We do all these calculations and we fire off the new game. All right. In the new game, in essence, we initialize all the pieces to not being hit. We initialize all these variables. All right. And then, I guess this is where we got to. We started um, the canon thread. Um, and the canon thread was down here. And this is the thread that controls the game, that is the motion of the stuff. So we have our UI, um, and we also have a thread then for the, the, the game processing, that is the actual moving of the elements of the game, and so on. We have some constructors on it and a set running state. When we actually run the game loop, though, we're doing this repeatedly over and over again as long as the thread is running. And we are trying to do these things. Now, notice that these things are in a synchronized block. Any idea what the synchronized block does in Java? Those things at a certain time, yeah. And how is this relevant as far as threads go? If you think back to our discussion of threads and threading, if you have thread A for the UI and thread B for the game behavior, the drawing of the game, the drawing of the screen, and it's bouncing back and forth between those things, there's certain things that we want to do in the game sort of as a unit, as a block, all right? And we don't want the thread to sort of switch while it's in the middle of doing these things. In other words, this stuff here, specifically, I would say the most meaningful ones, would be the updating positions and the drawing game elements. We want that to happen together. So we don't want the variables to logically say that this, the target or the blocker or whatever, is at position such and such, yet on the screen it's drawn in some other position. So in other words, we want to keep those things in sync. 
So that's what the synchronize does within Java, is it's used with threads, and it ensures that this chunk of code doesn't get, like, interrupted by the other thread. Let's look for a more formal definition of synchronized in Java and see what they say. Oops. doesn't really give a definition. That's discussing a... This is a better example. All synchronized blocks uh, synchronized on the same object can only have one thread executing inside them at the same time. All other threads attempting to enter the synchronized block are blocked until the thread exits it. So in a nutshell, keeps things from happening um, to interfere with each other. All right. So we really have two things going on here. We're updating the positions and we're drawing the game elements. These are both functions on the view itself. I can see where this gets confusing because we have a thread that calls methods on the view. We have our a uh, activity which calls methods on the view. So a lot of things are pointing to and calling stuff that exists on the view. Um, look at it this way. The view is where the brains, where the processing logic lives. We then essentially have two sort of control units. We have the activity control, which you know would be like the thread for the basic GUI, and then we have the game control, which is this Canon thread. So, calculating the position consists of Doing a bunch of math, really. Oh, let's see, what was it? Update positions? Yeah, update positions and draw game elements. Update positions, again, essentially updates the x and y coordinates of the different elements here. If we if the cannonball is visible, in other words, if we fired a shot, we're incrementing the x and y position um, of the cannonball. Remember, the x and y, uh, the, the speed of the cannonball, again, the vector can be broken down into an x and y uh, coordinates, and um, we essentially add those increments so we have it going across the screen. This allows us, the cannonball, to go in a diagonal, right, because we can aim it going any, you know, a, a range of, of motion. So that the velocity then has a speed in the up and down y coordinates and a speed on the horizontal or the x coordinates. So we're incrementing that. We look to see if it is in, if it gets hit by the blocker or not. This is the math which checks to see if the x and y of the cannonball overlaps with the x and y of the blocker. Remember, both the, the, the cannonball and the blocker have a certain thickness uh, about it, too. It's not a, a pure point line. There's a thickness. So in effect, what this is doing is this is seeing if the blocker and the cannonball overlap at all. If it is, we play the, the sound, we reverse the cannonball's direction. I didn't know it did that, all right? 
bounces off. I, I, I did not notice that. I don't have my Android device with me. I'm going to probably run upstairs in a second. Oh, you do? Okay, good. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I didn't notice it bounced off of it. I thought it just sort of exploded when it hit it. And the sound gets played, and you get the penalty. All right, so let's look at that. Ah, uh, the battery's dead. Let me run upstairs and grab one. I wouldn't do any new development in Flash. Yeah, I, I wouldn't do any new development in Flash. Partly and partly HTML5, right. I think I think Apple um, you know what do you want to say um, grease the rails you know it was on its way out anyhow but they they uh, 
they uh, accelerated that process. All right, let's go and run this. All this just to find out that it bounces off. I just don't remember seeing <laughs> see that. I guess that's not the only reason. But we go and not tangent. Right, but that's why it changes the one and not the other. See? It's reflecting. It's only reversing one of the velocities. It goes like that. So it only reverses the one velocity. The other velocity goes the same. So in other words, the, 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 the fact that it sh it's directed slightly downhill, it continues to go slightly downhill, but it goes in the other direction on the horizontal axis. So that's why they only negate the, that's why they only negate the, um, only negate the y. Um, velocity. Where is that? Right here. Or I'm sorry, only negate the x velocity. If we negated the y velocity, then it would go right back in the same direction that it came. Right? But if it does the 1, again, if it's heading slightly downhill, it will continue to go downhill, but instead of downhill to the right, it will go downhill to the left. And so uh, that's effectively reflect the, the angle of reflection. And we played the sound saying that you, you messed up. So that's a collision. Otherwise, we look to see if we, if the cannonball has gone past the edge of the screen. If the cannonball has gone past the edge of the screen, then the cannonball is no longer on the screen, and we turn the cannonball off. We actually do that both for the left and right walls. All right, we check both of them again because um, it could have either gone off the edge of the screen because we shot it, or gone off the edge of the screen because it got hit by the blocker. Then we look to see if the cannonball hit the target. All right. We use the same sort of logic that we did with the blocker with the target. All right. We look to see if it's between the start and end position or the thickness of the target. If it hit the target, we look to see which section it hit. And we simply do that by dividing and finding out where it hit within the target, the Y position. We verify that the piece hasn't been hit yet. If it has not been hit yet, we flip the It has not been uh, um, hit yet. We go and flip that flag indicating that it was hit. We destroy the, the cannonball. We increment the reward. And we play the little audio clip. All right? If all the pieces have been hit, we've won. All right? So all that code is for the cannonball, all right? And it considers really all the states that the cannonball could be in. First of all, the cannonball might not be at all on the screen, all right? So if it's not on the screen, we don't do anything with the cannonball. If it is on the screen, we move the cannonball. Then we see, did we hit the, blo did we hit the blocker? Did we go off the end of the screen? Did we hit the target? And the nice thing is, is we can do those probably in any sequence because they're mutually exclusive. It can't have hit the blocker and have gone off the screen. Right? So it doesn't really matter the order we check those in. All right? So after we do that, we then go and 
increment the position of the blocker. Notice that this interval, the blocker actually moves faster. Everything actually moves faster every second, if I'm not mistaken. That's what that's telling me. Let's watch. reading that code. At any rate, we update the blocker. We see if we've gotten to the end. If we've gotten to the end, we reverse it. So if we hit the bottom of the screen, we go up. If we hit the top of the screen, we go down. And we subtract uh, the interval from the time left. The time left hit zero then we are done. And we do the same thing with, actually we do both the blocker and the target sort of the same thing. We're just moving those up, up and down. All right. So, relatively straightforward, we're simply Controlling the x and y coordinates of three things. All right. The cannonball, the blocker, and the um, target. And based on some simple rules, whether it hits the end of the screen or not, whether it hits something, we then go and make our various adjustments. Now, do keep in mind, this is doing sort of the logical calculations of these things. We need to actually draw this stuff on the screen. All right? Because this doesn't really draw it. This just does the calculations and finds out if there's been a hit and so on. This method draw game elements is where we actually draw the screen. And that's also fairly straightforward. This is our first example where we're using the canvas, all right? The canvas is, again, is a way for us to draw on the screen programmatically as opposed to positioning a control on the screen via our XML. So here we're drawing on the screen programmatically those different pieces. And we can draw the background rectangle. That's what draws the big white rectangle. We draw text to show how much time is left. If the cannonball's on the screen, we draw the cannonball. We draw the cannon barrel. We draw the cannon base. Draw the blocker. Draw the target. Only thing that's a little bit odd about the target is the target's in the certain number of sections, I think seven sections. So we don't actually draw the target if it's already been hit. So we look to see if it's hit or not, and then we draw the, the, the target. Notice that we simply alternate back and forth, and making the, the target elements yellow or blue. The percent sign is the modulus operation, and what that does is it takes essentially the remainder. So if I has a value of zero, then when you divide zero by two, you get zero remainder. When you divide one by two, you get a one remainder. So first one, 
or actually it starts at 1. So the first time through the loop, it divides 1, not 0. My mistake. So the first one through, that's why the first one is blue, because you get a remainder of 1, so it sets the color to blue. Second time through, uh, i has a value of 2, so there's no remainder, and then it gets yellow, and so on. And then we draw the different pieces of the canvas, or, or the target, rather, on the canvas. And that's how we draw the game, all right? So, what we have to do, so, so that's, the, that's sort of the uh, game stuff that just goes on on its own. We now have to look at sort of the user action. In other words, what happens when they touch it to aim it? What happens when they double tap it to shoot it? All right. If you remember, those events or those gestures, rather, are handled by the activity. And specifically, they're handled by the gesture listener on that activity. If you remember last time, I didn't like the fact that this stuff was in the on-touch event. I wanted to keep it consistent, so I moved those two pieces of code to the gesture listener. So we do one of two things. We either align the cannon or we fire the cannon. Both of those are methods on that cannon view. There's the fire uh, method, here's the align. The line method, we're passing to it an event. Why do we need to pass to it an event? What do we do that for? What do, we, what do you suppose we're going to get from that event? That event encapsulates exactly what happened. In other words, I touch the screen, that's an event. I Swipe the screen, that's another uh, event. I double touch it, that's an event. What I'm going to get is I'm going to get two things. I'm going to get what event happened, and I'm going to get the x and y coordinates. All right? And the x and y coordinates are the most uh, relevant to this particular thing. Because if we move this, if I touch it, I want to aim the cannon, but I want to aim it to a location that, that corresponds to where I touch my finger. So I want to point it at where my finger touched. All right. In order to do that, we need to know where the finger touched. And that event, this motion event, encapsulates everything about that event, including where it touched. So. We then go and get, we get from the event the point that we touched at. And we create a variable called point, or called touch point, which is of type point, which we get the x and y coordinate related to the event. In a nutshell, these two things, that says where I touched on the screen. So we're creating a point object that represents where we touched on the screen. I then do a little math, all right? And you'd have to remember your trig better than me to explain completely what this is doing. In a nutshell, it's determining the angle at which I pointed, all right? So in other words, if I pointed...
here, I'm guessing the angle would be 90 degrees. If I touched up there, it would be zero, or close to zero. There it would be 180. It's going to use that when it goes and draws it. So this guy's job is to calculate the angle of the barrel. No, no, no never. That's, that's aiming at. That's where I'm aiming it at. Exactly. So in other words, to show it again, it's going, I touch there, it aims it there. I touch there, it aims it there. Oh, wrong screen. Touch there, it aims it there. Touch there, it aims it there. That angle, then, is used I believe when we oh, that angle is going to be used when we fire the cannon. That's right. This is where, and I'll talk about this in, in a minute here, this is where I, th I, I'm not crazy about this code, and I'll explain to you why in a minute here. This Align Cannon, it does two things. It points the barrel, and then it returns the angle that the barrel is pointed. So here we're calculating where the barrel is going to point, and then we also return the angle that it's pointed at. This is then going to be used when we draw the stuff to point the barrel where it needs to be pointed. Okay, now when we fire the cannon, if the cannonball is on the screen, we do nothing. All right, that's cheating. It's trying to shoot a couple of things. We don't have the mechanism to keep track of two cannonballs. All right. So, therefore, we better not let them fire it if the cannonball is show, uh, showing. Here's what I don't like about this. When we fire this, we aim first. All right? What I don't like about it is aiming is aiming, shooting is shooting. All right? I should break those down into two functions that I could call independently of each other, and I don't have to aim before I shoot. Now... <laughs> We can insert our own Dick Cheney or whatever jokes there if we want. But I should just be able to shoot the thing without aiming it first. This sort of, and the reason for this is that function that says, what does it say? A line cannon actually does two things. It determines the angle of the cannon and it positions the cannon. It should really only do there should be two separate functions for that. There should be a function to return the angle of the cannon. There should be a function to position the barrel of the cannon. Then I can call those independently. So I could make it, you know, think about, I could make it where a swipe shoots it without aiming, right, if I did that. And that's something we might look at doing after we've gone through this completely. Because I think that's a good exercise, and it shows how by really thinking through a function and limiting a function to do just one thing, 
we can make our functions much more powerful and allow for um, allow for more easy changing to it. This function really does two things. It positions a cannon and it determines the angle of the cannon. It should just do one of those two things and we should have a second function to do the other thing. Again, you would need to remember more about trig than me to explain why that is. Uh, essentially, the velocity is, uh, again, it is the, the bit of the vector, all right? In other words, it's going to have a certain speed, all right? Remember, speed is a, is a scalar, velocity is a vector. So we define a cannonball as having a certain speed, in other words, the rate at which it travels across the screen. But velocity is a vector, and we can break that vector down to an x and a y coordinate. So effectively what we're doing is if the speed is so much, Let's say the speed, we want to be five, I don't know, five something, five miles per hour, five pixels per second, I don't know, five something. All right. If we're at a certain angle then, and this then is the linear speed of five, it might be, again, depending on the angle, that composed of these two vectors, x and y, this might be 4 and 3. All right? Because if it's going 5 in that direction, again, we have a triangle. Using all that fancy stuff, we can come up with the fact that this could be 3 and this could be 4. Again, that depends on this angle, all right? If it's at more of an angle, then if it's tilted up more at an angle, this might be 4 and this might be 3, or just some combination that ends up to, uh, you know, fulfilling the, the rules of... Uh, of, of a right angle. And I trust those trig functions do, this, do that calculation for you. So, this then sets the two velocities, the, 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 the one in the x direction, the one in the y direction, says that the cannonball is now on the screen. That's that variable somewhere. Better, yeah, here. It then goes and plays the sound, and then we're off to the races. All right. Again, if you look at this, we have those two threads going on. The position and properties of things are calculated in two places. One of them is sorted by the game thread itself, all right, and methods in the canon view that get called by the game thread, and then there's other methods that get called by the main thread, the UI thread, to do change and control the cannonball and so on, all right? questions about this. So there's a lot in this one. It, but the interesting thing is, is when you break it down, it's really not that complicated. There's a lot of stuff, but none of the stuff is that complicated. Probably the most complicated stuff is to figure out the velocity and, and figure out aiming the cannon. That requires a little bit of math. 
most of the rest of the math is pretty straightforward. You're incrementing and decrementing to have the things go up and down. That's fairly straightforward. Now to my beef with this, all right? Do we have any questions before we, we, we consider my beef in a little more detail? Let's say I want to change the swipe gesture or the fling gesture to shoot without aiming. All right? So I should be able to, you know, the fling implies I'm doing something quickly. I'm shooting without aiming. So I could position it and then just fire away as, as much as I want to. All right? I can't do that now because the fire cannonball method calls the align cannon. So anytime I shoot, it aligns first. So there I shoot, it aligns first. What if I want to fling and have it shoot without aligning first? So I'm going to add a little more versatility to this. I'm going to make it so that a touch will aim it, a double touch will aim it and shoot it, and a fling will shoot without aiming. All right? That should be very straightforward to do, right? I should be able to do just this. You know, I hate to criticize the authors of this book because they probably were on deadlines and they were probably trying to get it out as quick as they could and blah, blah, blah. But I really think that this isn't the best coding and, and I, I, I would feel remiss if I didn't spend at least a little, little bit of time talking about it. What I should be able to do is this. I should be able to... On a double tap, align the cannon, and then shoot. All right. On a fling, I should just be able to fire the cannonball. And everything should work fine. And I should have that functionality. That should do what I want. But the fire cannonball function always calls the align. So this isn't going to work. We're just going to be back to where we were before, really. So I would like it if I could do that, but as I go and run this, we'll see that that's not the case. Because if I fling, it's going to aim it, because part of firing the cannon is aligning the cannon first. And if I double tap, it's going to aim it. And if I single tap, it's going to aim it. So no matter what I do, it's still aiming it on all three gestures. Oh. So even if I just swipe, it should fire it without aiming it, and it's not. OK. So let's go and let's correct that. And. You might think that, that I'm being, um, I'm nitpicking here, but I really don't think I am. Because I think the key to flexible software is developing good methods, and good methods only do one thing. This actually does two things. This calculates my angle, and it aligns the cannon. And I need to do one 
when I aim the cannon, I need to do the other one I shoot. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go in here and The line cannon method needs to know the event because it needs to position it. I'm going to go and I'm going to copy this. I'm going to make another method that says determine angle. This doesn't need any arguments because it assumes that the cannon's already been aimed, and I'm just telling you the angle that it was aimed at. All right. So to aim the cannon, I don't need to return anything anymore, because I'm just going to aim the cannon. I'm breaking out of it the piece of functionality that returns the angle. So I'm going to get rid of the return and make this a public void. I'm then going to get rid of my return statement. I then am going to this because we no longer have the event. This is actually the, I want to get the angle between touch point X. But the barrel end. Right. Now when I shoot the cannon, I call my new method. make a quick change here.
reason I'm making this change here is because I have this math to calculate the angle in two places. And that's not good. All right? Because what if that was wrong? What if the math to calculate the angle was wrong? I'd have two places I would need to fix it now. So I'm giving my determine angle method a point as an argument. Sometimes I'm going to give it the point of where I touched. Sometimes I'm going to give it the point of what the uh, barrel end is. All right. And I do my calculation. And I return the angle. So now when I go to align the cannon, I pass it the event. The event calls to determine the angle, calls my new method, passing the touch point. I then point that barrel end at that angle. If I fire it, I need to calculate the angle, and I do that based on the barrel end. So I get the angle for the barrel end. I use that then to determine the x and the y velocity, just like I did before. Now, cross my fingers, all right, I should be back on course to do what I want to do here, and that is have two different methods um, that are self-contained, and I don't get both of them when I call one. The other thing I noticed is this fire cannon event then no longer needs to be passed an event. I'm just shooting the cannon. So I can go here and get rid of the event that I pass it. Why? Because I'm not doing any aligning anymore. I don't care where it was touched. If I want to fire the cannon, I want to fire it. If I want to align it, I'll tell it to align it, then I'll tell it to fire it. So let's see if we have a winner here. something funky here. There I aim it. Doing something wrong here. So I'm doing something wrong here. I'm not really sure what. Um, I don't really feel like debugging this here. Uh, what I will do is I'll figure out what I'm doing wrong, and I'll post the, the finished example. Again, keep in mind as I demonstrate these things, the, the bigger lesson here isn't how to fire a cannonball or how to aim a cannon or anything like that. It's writing good code. All right. And we saw uh, the lessons from this one, number one, relate to the, the new stuff as far as this goes. First of all, we have the gesture listeners. That's important to, to understand. We have the concept of multi-threading. That is, we're going to have the activities 
thread, and we're going to add to that another thread to handle the stuff that's going on in the background, like the, the game mechanics of moving the thing back and forth and all that. Um, we have the notion of drawing on a canvas. All right, we did that through the one draw routine. And the extra thing that I tried to do here that I fell short of the mark for some reason, uh, I'll have to spend a little bit of time debugging that, is the notion of that one function was a bad function. It um, tried to do two things. It, it both aimed the cannon and returned the, the angle. And you really should separate that out. Um, I've heard it said that if a function contains the word and, it's a bad function. And this function didn't contain the word and, it was a line canon. But really, this function was a line canon and tell me the angle of the canon. And in that case, by that criteria, it's a bad function. So I separated those two out. Um, unfortunately, I did something wrong in the separation. And I'll have to go back and do a little debugging to figure out um, what was wrong with that. But I, I did this past semester, so worst case scenario, I'll go back to the, the files for last uh, semester and pull those out, because I did almost the exact same thing. Um, so I know I can do it, um, and I know I just probably made some dumb typo or something. All right? Any questions about this? Your next assignment, again, I still haven't written it up yet, but I know, well, I don't believe anyone's caught up, so that's okay. So we'll, we'll simply, uh, you know, we'll, this will be an assignment that I'll post for next week, is to essentially do, I want you to simulate a phone dialer. And what do I mean? A touchtone phone when you touch certain buttons, they make a certain sound. And there's actually a class in the Android Toolkit that allows you to do that. So I want you to create what looks like a phone keypad. And I want you that when you touch on this, when you touch the particular key, it plays the appropriate tone for that key. And adds the number to a text box up there. And does a little animation on the key that we touched. So if I touch a 7, it will make the beat for a 7, and it will shake the 7 or do a little animation on the 7. Maybe it will fade it out briefly. Do any animation you want. Have fun. And then it will take and it will display the number that I had, and it will simply accumulate the numbers that I pressed there. All right? The name of the class that contains the tones escapes me off the top of my head. I could probably look it up real quick. Um, but I will post that. Part of this assignment is to get you used to reading through the Java docs for a particular class that I've created. All right? or not that I created, but that, that someone else created. In this case, it is the um, um, Android framework. It is the Tone Generator class. And there's a whole bunch of tones that you can generate. Here's the tones for a 0 through 9. 
on the keyboard. And you can play those tones. Um, based on your user events. If you want to get fancy, make the tone last longer the longer you press. All right. Um, I, 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 since I haven't written up the specs for it, maybe I'll include that as part of the assignment. It's actually not that much harder, I don't think. But um, I'll take a look at it. All right. So if you are, if you've caught up, start thinking of that. Again, I wanted to, to sort of just review that. I will write up this assignment formally, but you could probably at least start getting the UI down and, and that sort of thing down um, so that when I uh, get to writing it up, um, you'll, um, you'll be in a position to complete it easily. Questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.